Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Doug Roberts from PS21. Uh, PS21, Portsmouth Smart Growth for the 21st Century. We present uh, informational events about planning in Portsmouth. Um, we believe that because people care about Portsmouth, they want to discuss the city's development and to participate in an informed discussion. So tonight's event is about seacoast uh, transportation. How do you get around now? What will be the best modes for seacoast transportation in the coming years? and how will they affect the way we live. Tonight, Bill Lyons, a transportation planner and Portsmouth resident, will be, uh, be part of a presentation and a panel discussion on the region's uh, transportation issues. Also, uh, with, along with Bill, will be representatives of the Coast Bus System, its executive director, Rad Nichols, Steve Pesci, Director of Special Projects for UNH um, Planning, and Scott Bogle of the Rockingham uh, County Planning Commission, where he is a senior transportation planner. Bill uh, will start off first with about a 20-minute presentation. He'll t explore the long-term picture of seacoast transportation, including innovative ways to incorporate sustainability, public health, land use, and climate considerations in decision making. He and the panel will also discuss the potential contribution of alternative modes of transportation like walking, biking, and transit, as well as the smart management of demand for parking and driving. Uh, this event is the final in a series of PS21 sponsored presentations this spring, featuring uh, experts discussing transportation and the management of city streets, and it's our eighth event in a little over a year. Uh, the seri this series is sponsored by the Corway Film Institute, and Seacoast Media Group is our media sponsor. Uh, after tonight, uh, we plan to think about what we might do and how we might finance it. Uh, if you have uh, suggestions, um, there's going to be some paper passed around, uh, right down uh, your thoughts, a few words uh, about the direction we might go, and uh, we'll try to uh, see what we can do in that direction. Um, so there are the, the bars open, I hope you've noticed. Um, and uh, I should also mention our website, ps21.info, not .com, not .org, not .net. You'll end up at a public school someplace if you go to PS, any of those. So um, tonight we have Bill Lyons who's going to do a 20-minute presentation. He'll be followed by a panel with three, these three uh, other local experts. They'll each talk for about five minutes about what they do. Uh, Bill will lead a question and answer with them for a little bit, and then we'll have questions from the audience. Um, so... Bill Lyons is a principal technical advisor in transportation planning at the Volpe Center, which is the U.S. National Transportation System Center in Cambridge. He has more than 30 years of experience working on urban transportation issues, uh, including innovative ways to consider economic development, public health, climate change, walk walking and biking, and livable communities. Lyons has also worked on international development projects in Africa and Asia. He's been active in Portsmouth Transportation Initiatives as a member of the Mayor's Blue Ridge and Ribbon Transportation Policy Committee, the Portsmouth Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee, and through Portsmouth Listens, and through uh, the Portsmouth Listens projects. He is speaking as a Portsmouth resident and not on behalf of the U.S. Department of Transportation. He would like every, they would like everyone to know. So, uh, Bill, please come on up. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doug, and thank you, PS21. Um, the perspective that I bring is uh, both uh, from work and uh, also from living in Portsmouth for almost 35 years and uh, being increasingly active. There's so much going on in uh, Portsmouth related to transportation and parking and land use. Uh, 
probably been involved like many of you have been uh, more and more over the last few years. So it just seems like a really good good time. Lots of enthusiasm, lots of ideas, and I, I think PS21 uh, deserves a lot of credit for putting together such a great series. I don't know about this one, but uh, the panelists will be good, and uh, the prior speakers were, were wonderful as well. Um, so uh, as an overview, I think my, my intent is to provide uh, some food for thought. Uh, basically put some big ideas out on the table to try to set a context uh, for the panel, to try to maybe um, identify four or five big, big picture trends uh, that not only are affecting Portsmouth, but are affecting uh, the, rest, uh, the rest of the country and the rest of the world in terms of uh, technology and demographics. And that'll be something I'll have to do uh, fairly, fairly quickly because the, the time is short. Um, and I, I think the, generally the theme for this is um, connectivity and alternative modes of transportation and really in, encouraging thinking about those really all together. Um, there are two uh, systems diagrams, and I think that they're very key to what I want to say uh, tonight. Um, the first is uh, really a, a kind of a connectivity. We spend a lot of time in Portsmouth thinking about parking, and we're, we're not thinking about parking. We're thinking about traffic. But really, if you, if you look at the rest of that pyramid, you see the transportation and you see the land use, and it's really those that can create the conditions that uh, either provide enough parking or uh, determine conditions where there's not enough parking and traffic. So it's really all those things fit together, and I think to really focus on any of those separately is really uh, to, lose, to lose opportunities because there are, there are great things that can happen when you think of all those together and problems that can happen if you don't. Um, why focus on transportation? Um, one of the cliches in, in my field is that it's a, it's a means, not an end. Nobody really cares about transportation directly. What we care about is what it does for us, that it gets us to school, it gets us to work, it gets us to the doctor, it gets us to recreation. Maybe there's some exceptions, recreational use, people who love driving. I normally don't love driving, uh, a lot of people do. But just I think the, the key point there is we, we have transportation to get us places. And more and more what we're seeing is technology that maybe accomplishes the same thing, access to schools, healthy food, uh, recreation, um, maybe that you can do without traveling. And that's a, one, of the, one of the key trends. Um, I think the challenge is to plan a transportation system that takes care of a lot of things for us. Uh, and it's, it's really those trade-offs and balance. And I think if you stepped away from the debates and the controversies that we've had for, for several years in Portsmouth about traffic and Portsmouth and, and parking and probably will continue to have as, as conditions change, uh, I think what you really see is beneath the surface there are major public policy issues that are being debated in terms of uh, who pays, who benefits, uh, can we have a strong economy? Can we preserve the historic character? Can we have a walkable, bikeable community? Can we be sustainable? And more about that in a minute. But beneath all the debate are these, these sorts of issues. Um, sustainable transportation, uh, it's, it's something that I've thought about quite a bit over the years. And I think sustainability is probably the number one most overused term uh, in, in, of the decade. It's, it's everywhere. And... Uh, my view is if it's everything, it's nothing, but um, it doesn't have to be everything and nothing. It, underneath the surface are some really key, key um, principles. If you uh, talk to um, transportation planners that are the real innovators, what you see is a, a real effort to use data and to use analysis to try to balance um, multiple goals. And uh, for sustainability, it's often called the three E's, economy, environment, and social equity or fairness. And I think that, that just the idea that those are all connected and that those have to be balanced, those have to be traded off, and that there's no one single absolute condition of sustainability, uh, the, the balance and the trade-offs and the politics and the values are going to be different in, in every community. But I think there is a lot of value uh, in using that as a, as a perspective. Uh, for transportation, uh, this is... Uh, 
concept that came out of a 10-year uh, international uh, study on uh, urban travel and sustainability that, that I got to work on. So I think somewhere way back in my, my memory, I probably helped coin some of, these, some of these phrases. But I think you see the key words there, and those are words that resonate with that definition of sustainability. Equity, affordability, choice. Then on the environmental side, it preserves resources. It doesn't leave our uh, children and grandchildren uh, without, without the resources and without the access uh, there's, I think there's a lot of substance there, and Portsmouth has, has taken votes on eco municipality and has a sustainability community uh, committee. This is something that's been taken very seriously in Portsmouth. Um, for the big picture context, uh, there are four or five things that I just really want to point out, and I think these come up uh, for Portsmouth as it looks toward the future, as it consider, continue, considers transportation alternatives. Uh, there are some very important things happening. One is, one is affordability, and just the point that transportation is very expensive for households, uh, that, that um, 17 of the 28 regions in the country spend, households spend more money on transportation than they do on housing. And that may be why so many um, uh, communities for millennials and younger folks are looking for ways to save that, that transportation share and maybe use that discretionary income for other things, for, for housing or rec recreation, um, all kinds of other activities. You can see up in uh, New Hampshire, things are, are maybe not so bad for us. I think that's probably because we don't drive great distances like some of the rest of the country, and that's, that's a big trend when you look at the uh, orangish areas. Those are areas where people drive and drive and drive. Um, changing context, travel behavior, and millennials. At the kickoff for the um, um, master plan, the consultants did a terrific job on talking about this as part of a major trend. So I won't, I won't touch on it in much um, depth other than just to um, maybe observe that right now, after many, many years of increases of miles traveled, uh, not only um, total aggregate for the country, but per capita, up and up and up, it's um, leveling off and, in fact, has gone down a bit. And there are a lot of factors that could be contributing to that. I mean, one has been... The recession, so that's down. The other is gas prices uh, down, so that would push the, the miles up. But more and more, there are some conclusions that people's preferences, not affordability, but just preferences, what they really want, are shifting. And I think particularly that point about the millennials we heard in the master plan uh, kickoff. Um, more and more delayed car ownership, later licenses, sometimes not even driver's licenses, attractive alternatives, uh, Walking, biking, transit, car, bike share. Um, our, our son just started working in Washington and very happily has no car. He makes do with bike sharing, with transit, with car sharing. He has a very good life, and he puts an extra $10,000 a year in his pocket to do other things. And he's got, I think, no loss of other things that he could do with 10000 including paying off school loans. I mean, a lot of other things can be done with that money, and that's a, that's a choice. Uh, and it's becoming more and more common. With all the uh, discussions in the charrettes, we heard lots of discussion about um, the interest in um, demographic diversity, uh, attracting or retaining younger population, um, providing the transportation and maybe the housing alternatives that would appeal, uh, things like the micro-housing. It's really all part of the same question. The con conclusion, this is just from this week in USA Today, communities will have to accommodate this demand for choice in transportation or risk losing millennials to places that do. Uh, another, another interesting uh, trend is the shared economy, and we've seen a lot of debate in Portsmouth about Airbnb and Uber. It's, it's out there. It's coming. I think that uh, Portsmouth has had healthy debates and seems to be uh, finding a um, grounds for moving forward. It's a, a, a similar situation in communities around the country, but it's, it's really growing. Uber, Uber 160,000 drivers. People can make $18 an hour in spare time or full-time full -time work. Uh, the car sharing is, is uh, growing around the world as well. An interesting example is the flight car, which I haven't actually encountered or talked to anyone who actually did, where you drive your car to the airport and you leave it, and somebody else rents it and pays you, and when you come back, your car is waiting for you, along with money that's been credited to your, your uh, flight car account with the same um, 
transparency and guarantees and um, endorsements of, of lenders and users that are in uh, Airbnb, Airbnb and, and Uber. This is a big trend, and um, I, I work in uh, Kendall Square in Cambridge, and um, many, many of my colleagues are under 30, and they don't, they don't have cars. They use, they use these services. They bike share, they car share, they use transit. Uh, when they need to, they rent a car or they use zip car. That, that, really, is, that really is a trend. Uh, one other big trend that's coming to us that will have an impact, Portsmouth and everywhere, is autonomous cars. There you see the Google cars. Uh, probably you've read in the paper that these are, are out and in use and in, in several states being uh, driven legally, uh, automated cars. When you think about all the automation that is slowly being built into your cars, it's, it's not a turn the light switch on, everything's automated. It's, it's gradual, it's sequential. It's happening unless you drive an old car like I do, then you're, you're sort of out of the picture. But if you're buying new cars, you, you start to realize that there are more and more of these features to the point where it gets t completely automated. And Google is, is saying uh, by, by 2017, not everybody, but that it, it will be available in the market. Now, this has some big impacts. Uh, think of it in terms of are these personal cars? Are they shared cars? Is there a fleet like car sharing? of autonomous cars that come, come and pick you up at your house and take you to work. Um, use of existing road space. Uh, w one of the real advantages of this is instead of building more road capacity, uh, new lanes, the cars can um, go closer and closer together, really just, just inches apart safely, thereby making much more efficient use of the road space, uh, getting rid of fender benders and accidents, just very efficient. You can uh, read the paper, l legally use your cell phone, all sorts of things uh, that you can imagine. Um, safety um, uh, cl claims that it would be much safer because it eliminates the human element. Uh, less parking. If you don't need your own car, then you don't need the cars in your garage or in your driveway or on the street. You have a fleet of shared cars downtown that maybe come around and pick you up when you need one. Um, maybe then uh, we will have to rethink uh, the the supply of supply of parking. There are big issues though, and maybe I, I know Steve Pesci is thinking about some of those things. So maybe they'll come up on the panel. Um, I mean, what happens when you want to uh, send your five-year-old to grandma's house? Does a car pull up and off she goes, off to grandma's house? What if grandma lives in another state? And sort of the mind the mind staggers when you think about it. There are questions of of equity and affordability how well these new technologies would fit with the existing system, including public transit. So a lot of issues and a lot of interesting debate, but it's, it's coming fast. Again, back to the second systems approach, and that is the connectivity of transit and walking and biking, demand management, single occupant um, car. Let's see, my pointer here. Um, I mean, the, a lot of communities will use the total vehicle miles traveled or the car trips is part of a of goal to manage to reduce that. And that can be done through increasing these alternatives. More public transit, which Rad is going to talk about later. Walking and biking, Scott will talk about that. Demand management, I think the panel will discuss that in general. The demand management is something I'll talk about in a minute, but that, for example, is the market pricing of parking that Michael Manville talked about in the earlier presentation. But I, I think it's key to look at all of these things together and to see right here really this sweet spot is what determines the demand for parking, but that in turn is affected by how much of the travel these other pieces take care of. Uh, this is a very famous picture and uh, what you see is a contrast between cars and people. As many people would take this many single occupant vehicle cars, this many people could go on the bus, and this many people, this is how many bikes they would use. Anybody really quick about maybe what the weakness is in this slide? Well, the bike is by such a group of people. Yeah, I think the bikes are just sitting there. These are the bikes people here. Okay, okay. But any, any questions about the bus? I don't know, Rad would figure this one out quickly. The assumption is that this bus is full in standing room only, and that's often, often in <laughs> most communities not, not, not always the reality, but this, this is a very, very famous picture. 
uh, attractive options for transit. Uh, we'll talk about this in the panel. I think when you say transit, people think coast, but also public transit includes Wildcat, which uh, Steve will talk about, CNJ, Down Easter, uh, and the parking shuttle. Those are all parts of public transit, but maybe there's some opportunity to connect those pieces together. And if they grow and continue to go, it seems like it would be an, a lost opportunity not to look at further connections. CNJ is um, a private contract carrier that operates using the um, state's parking lot, the state's terminal, and leased state buses. I, don't, I think a lot of people, including my fellow commuters to Cambridge, may not, may not really realize that that is public transit. Transit alternatives. Here's an example of um, connectivity, uh, a shuttle, public transit, parking in the neighbor town Gloucester, which was one of the piers that the Portsmouth Listen study circles looked at. Uh, this is a picture that I took off of the red line coming home a few months ago. But what you see is the suggestion, take the tea to Gloucester, hop the shuttle, go to the restaurants, go to the historic sites, you don't need to drive. Or if you're going to drive, drive, park, ride the shuttle. And this is another historic seacoast town. What they've done is they've connected all of these modes of transportation together. I think it would be very interesting to see what the scale is and how much they've managed to affect this. I, I suspect this may be, may be seasonal, but there's nothing wrong with targeting it to be seasonal. Uh, walking and biking alternatives. Um, uh, Juliet Walker and the planning department have done a terrific job on the city bike ped plan. I would recommend anybody uh, who hasn't seen it to take a look at it. It's been approved and uh, now moving ahead to the next step of implementation. So if this is something that you're interested in, I would encourage you to take a look at that because there will be some, some serious choices going into the future year about investing in the recommendations. Uh, you see bike sharing and uh, a dedicated uh, bike lane there. Uh, transportation demand management, it's a very important component. Um, often there's an emphasis on the supply side. On the supply side, of, on, for parking, the supply side is provide more parking to meet growing demand. The supply side for cars is um, build more roads, expand um, the road capacity. The demand side is to, to manage that, to manage that with market pricing, to manage that with attractive alternatives. So I think that that demand management is really a very important piece of the, of the whole package. Uh, the panelists will talk a bit about transportation management associations, including transit benefits, uh, where under the tax code, employers can provide a tax-free benefit of $135 a month to the employees who don't have to pay taxes on that as a benefit. That would be a way for employers to support their employees using transit equivalent to doing the same with parking and getting a tax write-off of $270 uh, for parking. Anybody here get uh, tax transit benefits? Yeah, that's interesting that it's not better done or better known. That's a real, um, it's a real attractive tool as an alternative to driving. Um, parking and smart management, supply side, in Portsmouth, I think there's the principle that the city manages the parking supply rather than um, contracting it out to the private sector. Uh, the second garage has been passed, so I, th I think really looking at a lot of these ideas, it's sort of post-second garage. But I wouldn't say it's post-parking because the issues and the challenges of parking are going to just continue as part of the bigger transportation issue, particularly if we're looking five years and 20 years down the road. On the demand side... Um, Smart management of scarce public resources. Uh, can there be free parking? And I think the free parking is, is something that is not consistent with the market pricing. Um, it's a whole, other, a whole other topic, and I think uh, Manville covered that really well. Um, anybody know why I've got the zebra up there? From, from uh, Manville's presentation, he's, when asked, what do you do with the money? from increasing the parking to, say, $2 an hour in the most attractive downtown spots. He said, it doesn't really matter. It's the price that's most important because then you can manage to a target like a turnover rate, let's say uh, an optimal 85%. Turnover rate, doesn't matter. Buy a zebra. Or if you're going to do it in a particular business neighborhood, spend the money on amenities uh, 
um, landscaping, street furniture, street lights for that neighborhood. But I think that's maybe where the difference between a parking expert and a transportation expert ends. Because a transportation expert would say parking is part of the transportation. Think about how to use that money. So not only are you pricing to manage the demand for parking, but consider how to spend that money. It could be spent for additional parking spots, or it could be spent for alternatives like transit or walking and biking. Because if you spend a dollar gained from the market pricing on an attractive, um, improved transit, then you may get one more person out of their car to be using that new transit system. So you almost get a two-for-one two type of benefit there. Uh, parking balance, a couple of quick examples. This is a picture I just took last week at uh, Central Square. Very simple um, market pricing. What you see is a dollar an hour during the day, then $2 an hour. It's, this is Central Square when it gets really busy, 6 to 10, Monday through Saturday. So they, they, don't, charge on, they don't charge on Sunday. But... That's a parking lot that's in a, a part of the city that has a lot of restaurants, a lot of small retail stores, a lot of um, employees and staff that, who, who aren't paid very well, um, also in a busy neighborhood. That could be a free parking lot. It could be a free parking lot um, to help the um, low-wage workers or to provide extra parking for the really crowded neighborhood. But the problem is if you did that, you would have that parking lot protect, perpetually full with no place for people to park when they want to go to the restaurants. So they've priced it in a um, get the pricing right kind of way. Priced to have the right turnover, earning some money. Interesting, it would be interesting to see uh, what happens with the money. They can certainly adjust that and they can adjust the hours. That's a kind of a simple version. This is a much more complicated version that I took at the University of California uh, parking lot in Berkeley. And what you see is really everything that we've been talking about recently on parking. Uh, you have a lot where um, employees of the university have C and F parking stickers that could be residents. They can park for free. Maybe they paid for the permit. Maybe not. I mean, all that is public policy type of decision. The rest of the public can pay to park because they've priced it in a way where there's turnover and ample space. But then down here, uh, what you see is football day. So these are the days when the crummy UC Berkeley team plays. Uh, if it's Stanford, then it's really crowded. But what that says is if you can park here, it's going to be really expensive. You know, this is premium day. You know, maybe the analogy here is, you know, big, big days in Portsmouth, Prescott Park, big concerts or something like that. I mean, what you've got is just one simple sign. There's got to be some technology and thinking behind it. But you have a lot... This is a lot doesn't even look that full. It's right next to the campus, right in downtown Berkeley, but it's serving a lot of purposes in a really clever, really clever kind of way. And it gets easier if you start introducing technology um, for, the, for the pricing. It could be very flexible. Um, one idea is maybe we could take the private lots in Portsmouth, make it worthwhile for the banks at the most crowded times on the weekends and evenings, have those managed as a group, get a vendor to do something, like this, price the parking, because right now it's free, and again, with the free parking, you always have the risk that it's, it's not being used in the optimal way. So just, it's just something to think about. Uh, again, I think the key here is everything fits together. Everything is connected. You can't look at parking. You can't look at um, managing traffic without looking at all three of those things, the walking, the biking, the transit, and the demand management. Uh, putting the pieces together in a balanced approach, uh, Portsmouth Listen's second group did a wonderful job looking at peers, doing case studies, finding what they liked about peers. So I would direct you to look at that. Instead of taking one of those, like a really good Portsmouth peer, I took some com two completely different places just to, you know, maybe stir things up a little bit and just show completely, completely different areas. Um, and I think the key here is that it's, it's the balance. And there's probably no place in the world that has a bigger challenge to try to have economic growth in a really crowded island and has pulled it off by putting all those pieces together. Market pricing, congestion pr charges for going past a cordon around the area that it charges you according to the traffic and the, the time of day. Uh, very limited parking, very expensive parking. Uh, not only market pricing for, market pricing for parking, but market pricing for cars. 
So if you want to own a car, you have to bid on an auction. Singapore has a limited number of car permits that are available each year, and you bid on the market for that. And when you've bought a permit, you can resell it with your car. But that severely limits. It raises a lot of revenue. It severely limits the amount of cars, but they can pull that off because then they turn around and spend that money on the transportation al alternatives, really attractive transportation alternatives. Uh, tying land use to transportation, um, very significant transit-oriented development. A dynamic market, um, affordable transportation, managed traffic, reduced emissions, they're, they're, they're working on all of these goals. I mean, it, it's crowded, it looks like this. Of course, this is nothing like Portsmouth, but I think the key is this is probably the best public transit system in the country. It runs maybe every three minutes. It's completely automated, completely clean, completely safe. These people are paying less than $2 a ride instead of bidding for the price of a, of a car permit. It, it, works, it works really well. And in the long-range plan, Singapore um, expects to have 80% of the population within 400 meters of walk, of fixed route rapid transit like this. All part of the master plan, and it works. Of course, Singapore is famous. I, I didn't get a picture of the sign that shows no spitting, no cigarettes, automatic fines. I mean, no questions asked. I mean, it's no stinky food. It's, it's a different place. It's, it's just interesting to look at. One more thing is uh, Kendall Square, uh, where I work. Probably a lot of you are, are familiar with that area and how much it's grown. It's uh, New England Silicon Valley, MIT, Google, uh, Microsoft. Our, our building is 20 undeveloped acres, and there's a land rush on for developers to try to bid, bid for the federal, the federal land right in the heart of Central Square. But over the 2000 to 2010, the business space has gone up 38%. And if you've driven through that area, that's believable. And you see all the new re restaurants and retail centers and... Uh, Shops, but then you look down here and you see, you see what's happened to traffic on Broadway, the main street where our building is. You see that it's actually gone down. And I can look out my window, and I, I, I haven't counted, but I see many, many more pedestrians than I see cars. And um, a lane each direction on uh, Broadway has been taken uh, for a premium uh, bike and walk facility, and there aren't traffic jams there. Uh, Themes going forward, maybe just to summarize, uh, recap here a bit, um, plan for the future. I mean, a lot of times we're trying to solve today's problem or a problem in a year or two or even yesterday's problem. I think the challenge, particularly if we want to help make Portsmouth the sort of city that we would all like it to be, is to go long, look five and 20 years, even look 50 years if you're thinking about things like uh, climate, sea level rising, uh, move beyond parking. It's a complex and evolving future. You need to look at parking in the, in the larger context, uh, set goals and metrics, uh, and then back up and find, find the best approach for doing that. If the target is to reduce vehicle trips or vehicle miles, then look at a really attractive alternatives or demand management that can accomplish that. Always look for the connectivity. Uh, at every one of the PS21 and Portsmouth Listens, often people ask questions about, well, this is... This is interesting. Uh, how can I get involved? I think probably a lot of people in the room are already involved in some of these action activities, but um, the master plan study circles are going on. I think they already be already began. Is that, that right? But I think there'll be opportunities. Uh, maybe Rick can make a, a comment on that for people who aren't in the study circles to, to comment or to come to meetings or give, give input as well. I mean, that master plan is land use and transportation and the connectivity is, is, is certainly going to be there. The design charrettes have been really successful, um, imaginative efforts. PS21, the bike ped plan, and moving into the implementation. And there are, these issues are coming up constantly. I mean, if you go to the city council meetings and you hear the discussions, more and more you hear some of these broader, longer-term ideas. I mean, people are, are thinking about these things. It's a, really a, a chance to... to, to uh, to participate and make your views known. And that's it. Thank you. So we will have a transition to our wonderful panelists. And they're each going to uh, 
We gave them a, a miser, miser, miserly five minutes. They all could have used as much time as I got to have. But um, so I think that we'll start with, what did we say, Scott? Yeah. Scott. OK. So Scott and Rad Scott and, and Steve. And I think that I'll advance your slides if I can find the slides. First, we're going to have, uh, did we say Scott? Yep. Yeah. Scott Bogle, who is the um, Senior Transportation Planner at the Rockingham Planning Commission, the uh, Seacoast Metropolitan Planning Organization, and is going to uh, give us a, a, a little bit of an intro related to the work that uh, the Seacoast um, Planning Commission does, particularly related to bikes, ped, pedestrians, and um, demand management. Why don't I start in and the slides will be up quickly. Uh, thanks to Bill and also I want to thank uh, Doug Roberts and the PS21 Steering Committee for the uh, opportunity to join the panel tonight. Um, I'm Scott Bogle. I'm a Senior Transportation Planner with the Rockingham Planning Commission. For those of you who may not be familiar with uh, Rockingham Planning Commission, uh, we're one of nine regional planning commissions around the state of New Hampshire. Uh, despite the name, we're actually not affiliated with Rockingham County. Um, our funding is, uh, is a combination, um, at least on the transportation side, of federal funding and uh, local dollars that match the federal dollars. Uh, we provide technical assistance to our 26 member communities with local and regional uh, transportation planning, land use planning, uh, issues related to housing, natural resources. Um, for our smaller communities, uh, we actually, uh, in some cases, provide part-time planning services, communities that don't have full-time uh, planning staff, unlike Portsmouth. Um, as Bill alluded to, we're also the federally designated metropolitan planning organization for southeastern New Hampshire. Um, every urbanized area in the country has an MPO. Uh, MPOs are designed to ensure local input on decision-making uh, for programming federal transportation dollars. And they uh, came out of the 1960s. Uh, MPOs were first established in the 1960s, sort of in response to some of the urban clear-cutting projects that happened with the development of the interstate highway system. If you think about the central artery that cut right through the north end in Boston, the idea of MPOs was to have local input to decide how federal transportation dollars would be spent. Um, we're responsible as the, as the MPO for developing a 20-year a uh, long-range transportation plan for the region that's both policies and project specific, and also a, a four-year transportation improvement program. Uh, we don't actually have a standalone bicycle and pedestrian plan. We haven't historically. Our regional long-range transportation plan does uh, have elements that deal with the highway system, with public transportation, transportation demand management, uh, bicycling and walking, interaction of uh, transportation system with, the, uh, with land use and land development. Um, we actually have in our work plan for the coming year, starting July 1st, uh, a project to develop our first uh, standalone bicycle and pedestrian plan for the region, and that'll be working in conjunction with the State Department of Transportation, which is going to be updating the state bike ped plan. Uh, the current state bike ped plan dates to 2000 and is, is fairly limited. Uh, as we work on that, um, I think we'll uh, be looking to build on what I think has uh, been excellent work that was done by Tool Design Group and, uh, and the city in the city's new bicycle pedestrian master plan. Um, we have worked, we do work on uh, various regional bicycle and pedestrian uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, Several of those would be um, the New Hampshire Seacoast Greenway, which is New Hampshire's segment of the East Coast Greenway, which is envisioned to be a 3,000 mile long uh, urban Appalachian trail running from Callis, Maine down to Key West. Um, I've also worked over time uh, on the Great Bay Bicycle Loop. That was something that was uh, set as a priority by uh, Rockingham Planning Commission, Stratford Regional Planning Commission, and Sabre uh, going back to the 1990s. And, there have been some key projects here in Portsmouth that are part of that, the bike bridge over the Spalding Turnpike, most recently the uh, Pease multi-use path, 
Um, this summer, the shoulders between Durham and Newmarket are finally going to be built. Uh, it's another key link in that, and also shoulders on 108 from um, Newmarket to Newfields. Ah, ah. Um, I think that Steve and Rad will touch on this later. This, uh, the map shows our region, but also uh, highlights uh, different transit uh, services in the region. Um, and it, it highlights really for a, for a uh, city the size of Portsmouth and for this region, we are the beneficiaries of a, a pretty remarkable transit network. You see uh, Wildcat Route 7, or Route uh, 5, 4, pardon me, coming in here from Durham to Portsmouth. Uh, the red here is CNJ, um, inner city bus service, uh, starting up in Dover, coming down through Portsmouth Transportation Center. Um, coast, the coast route network is in green here. Um, also for inner city bus, you see a snippet of the Boston Express service in the I-93 corridor. See the down easter here in green. Uh, and then the uh, East-West Express that connects Portsmouth to Manchester Airport in downtown Manchester. I think we'll probably talk about those a little bit more when the transit uh, agencies speak. Can we have the other slide? So a point that I wanted to bring up uh, just to round out uh, what I say about the Rocky Ann Planning Commission and bike ped planning has to do with thinking beyond infrastructure. Uh, Bill earlier mentioned three E's of uh, equity, economy, and, and uh, environment. Um, it turns out that E is an especially useful letter if you're a planner. Uh, <laughs> there are actually another five E's that are often used uh, in thinking about bicycle and pedestrian planning and encouraging people to consider biking or walking as an alternative to driving. And those are engineering, which is, is your infrastructure part, building your sidewalks and, and bike lanes and uh, rail trails. <clears throat> but building that infrastructure is necessary, but not necessarily sufficient uh, in order to optimize use of those facilities. You also want to have education, um, bike safety education for youth and for adults, how to, how to ride uh, in traffic. Um, and public education for drivers to ensure that drivers understand the uh, rules of the road, rights and responsibilities uh, of drivers as well as bicyclists. Uh, encouragement, is activities that make it fun to and remove the barrier to trying something new. Things like bike to work day or like the, the business to business challenge, multimodal commuter challenge that um, Seacoast commuter, that uh, Commute Smart Seacoast runs that I'll talk about in a minute. On the enforcement side, ensuring that uh, law enforcement, that police departments are aware of all of the rights and responsibilities of bicyclists, um, and ensuring that you know, there's speed enforcement, and in some cases, perhaps looking at additional laws that may be useful, things like a vulnerable user law. Uh, and finally, evaluation. Um, you know, there's a, a phrase that somebody from the Rails to Trails Conservancy uses, if you don't count, you don't count. And Portsmouth, uh, as part of the update to the um, bike ped plan, uh, did a comprehensive set of bicycle and pedestrian counts last summer. They're going to be updating those on an annual basis. Uh, we're starting to do that at the regional level as well. Um, and also there's a, there's a mandate on MPOs uh, from Federal Highway Administration now to do more with performance-based planning where we're uh, establishing metrics, uh, doing data collection to monitor those and um, track our progress against those. So I think I've probably exceeded my five minutes for the RPC, but uh, since Ann Rugg from um, Commute Smart Seacoast uh, was called away, uh, I was also going to talk briefly about um, transportation demand management and our TMA here in the Seacoast. Same presentation, right? Yeah. Same presentation, actually. Oh, it's the same uh, presentation. Yeah. Okay. I was going to start struggling with the next one. Oh, shoot. All right, terrific. So Commute Smart Seacoast uh, is a is a transportation management association or a TMA. And TMAs are 
organizations that work with employers to um, let employees know about their options in terms of commuting. Uh, what are their alternatives to driving, whether that's transit or carpooling or biking or walking, and to try to reduce the barriers to choosing one of those options. Um, Commute Smart Seacoast, I think, started about 18 months ago. Uh, in their first year and a half, um, they've recruited 30 member companies, uh, representing over 10,000 employees. Um, uh, some of those companies include uh, Lonza, Sig Sauer, uh, City of Portsmouth, actually, um, Bottom Line Technologies, uh, some of the larger employers over at Pease and elsewhere in the region. Um, and so the, the TMA provides information to employees about, about what their commute options are. Uh, oftentimes, employees may not know that a coast bus runs right by their building, and they have the option to take a bus, and it's pretty easy to do. Uh, or that uh, they could um, connect with somebody else who works in their company or maybe the next building over and, and uh, start a carpool. One of the other great benefits that the TMA offers is an emergency ride home. Uh, and the idea here is that if you've come in on the bus in the morning and you get a call at one in the afternoon that your child who's in third grade is sick and in the nurse's office and you need to get home and, and uh, take that, uh, pick up that child, that uh, you can take a taxi, and that will be uh, covered for free by the TMA to get you home to take care of that emergency. Um, the TMA also operates a, a carpool matching database. This is a secure online database. I think there are about 600 uh, people that are in it currently. Uh, it helps you match up um, folks who you might be able to set up a carpool with based on where you're going to, where you're coming from in the time of day. And the membership is free. We have the next one. Uh, just a quick look at benefits for employers and benefits for employees. This is a this is a free benefit that employers can offer employees. Um, uh, Bill earlier mentioned the the tax incentives uh, that go along with um, the the federal commuter benefit tax. Uh, tax incentive. Um, to our knowledge, the only major employer offering that in the seacoast is Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. Uh, Rad can talk about that a little bit later, but um, that's something that you see down in Boston. A lot of major employers offer uh, a tax-free benefit to help cover the cost of your transit commute. Um, participation in the TMA can, can improve employee morale, mainly through participation in the various challenges that uh, are offered throughout the year. Uh, bottom line competes with Lanza, competes with Newmarket International on a commuter challenge to see who can have the most people uh, walk or bike or ride transit or carpool uh, during a given week. And that uh, creates some good rivalry on, on base over at Pease and, uh, and uh, creates some fun. Uh, and in many parts of the country, uh, employers use, successfully use, TMAs to reduce their parking need and associated costs from providing parking. Um, on the employee side, as an employee, uh, gets across the idea that you can save a lot of money by not driving a car. Um, thousands of dollars a year by riding the bus or uh, riding your bike or taking a carpool. Um, if you're riding or walking, uh, opportunity to improve your health. Uh, and I think if you're riding the bus, there's a good, com good uh, community that develops on the bus. Uh, and so uh, there's fun to be had on the bus as well. There are monthly prize drawings for all uh, folks who are uh, members of the TMA. And then something else that uh, folks who participated in the P's B2B challenge last fall cited as why they participated uh, is environmental benefits in the, the sense they're doing something to help the environment. And then last slide. And just a note about that P's to B2B challenge. The, the first one they ran was back in October. Um, this was a two week long challenge to see what company at P's could have the most people get to work by some means other than driving during that period. And there are nine companies that participated, uh, 160 individual employees, uh, 1,148 avoided auto trips, almost 21,000 miles uh, of avoided auto travel. And so if you think about it, that's what, uh, more than 80% of the way around the globe in terms of mileage. 
Um, and in fact, they've seen ongoing behavior change based on the number of people that, for example, were participating in carpools at the beginning, number of people from a, uh, a post-survey said that they would continue to participate in carpools on an ongoing basis. And in fact, the TM um, Commute Smart won an award for this um, from the uh, Association for Commuter Transit, which is the industry association for TMAs. And there's another one coming up in June. Uh, also, uh, Commute Smart has been a partner in Seacoast Bike to Work Week, which is happening this week. Uh, and maybe I'll have a chance to say a little more about that later. So thanks. Thank you, Scott. Next, next up, uh, we have uh, Rad Nichols, who is the executive director of Coast. So I'm Rad Nichols. I'm the executive director of Coast. Um, coming into my 19th year at Coast, uh, started in 1993, took a short hiatus down in Boston with the MBTA advisory board. That was an experience. <laughs> and then worked my way back up uh, <clears throat> through Haverhill, back up to Coast in uh, 2000 and actually in 99. Um, we are an organization that was first formed in 1981 as a nonprofit by a group of philanthropic individuals in the region who are interested in creating a better network of, of publicly accessible uh, transit services, kind of, kind of bringing together the, the disparate uh, number of services that were available in the region at the time. One of the first things they, they decided need to, needed to be done was to create a backbone uh, of a system, a fixed route uh, public transit system that everybody could feed into and out of. Uh, so we began providing service in 1982, and we contracted with private uh, local providers to be able to do that. We also began a longstanding relationship with the University of New Hampshire and Caravan Service at the time. Caravan actually began uh, managing and operating our ser services for us in the mid-'80s, and that ran through uh, about 98. Uh, in 1985, we were further defined as an independent public body of the state of New Hampshire so that we could become a direct recipient of federal transit administration funds uh, and, not, uh, and uh, give the New Hampshire DOT the opportunity of stepping away from the plate and playing the middleman, which they were more than happy to do at the time. Uh, services we operate in Portsmouth, our, our Route 2, which runs between Rochester, Summersworth, Dover, Newington, and Portsmouth, terminating in Market Square. Uh, and then our Route 7 bus, which runs currently between Exeter, Stratum, Newmarket, Greenland, Portsmouth, and Newington. Uh, the Portsmouth por portion is on Route 33 and then through Pease. Um, uh, we also have our two trolley routes, Route 40, uh, which uh, connects Market Square out Islington Street to the Pease International Trade Port in Newington, uh, as well as Route 41, which runs down Middle and Lafayette Roads uh, out of Market Square. Uh, the Lafayette uh, Road Trolley, Route 41, we also offer an extension at key times of the day over to the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard to get shipyarders who live in, in Portsmouth over to work and back uh, at, at key times. Additionally, we offer uh, ADA paratransit service. This is an on-demand service uh, that uh, is available for individuals with disabilities who, because of that disability, cannot otherwise use the fixed route uh, bus service. Either they can't get from their home to the bus stop, they can't wait at the bus stop, or they can't negotiate the system once they're on board uh, due to their disability. Um, that is, in fact, the fastest growing segment of our business. Um, we do offer connections to Wildcat Transit, uh, CNJ, the Down Easter, Greyhound, and the East West Express. And look at that, I've already covered slide two. Sorry, Bill. Uh, uh, I will say in Bill's presentation, there were a couple things I wanted to follow up on. If you're interested in autonomous cars, we do that. We just have somebody else behind the wheel. You can be <laughs> autonomous back in the back. You can read, you can text, you can do whatever you want that's legal. You can't um, send your five-year-old, though. We encourage that. You cannot send your five-year-old five uh, by themselves. They can be uh, escorted by somebody uh, in charge. Um, and I, I'll also point out that the comment about the famous photo, and you said Rad will be able to pick this out, 
no, I can't, Bill, because both Wildcat Transit and Coast, we operate buses with that many people on board <laughs> every single day. And so, um, you know, that's not as, as unique or unusual here in the Seacoast as you might think. Um, I will say also that the, uh, the, the commuter benefit, the federal commuter benefit of $135, that is how uh, we are, uh, we are uh, being able to provide our, our newest services, which are the Portsmouth uh, Naval Shipyard Clipper Connection services. We offer commuter express buses from uh, Summersworth and the Berwicks through Elliott to Kittery. Uh, and, uh, we have a bus that runs uh, from Dover to the shipyard, and we also have a bus that runs from Rochester to the shipyard. And uh, typically on our system, we're covering about 15% of our expenses through the fare box. So what folks are putting into the, to the fare box when they board covers about 15% of the cost. With the shipyard service, because the shipyarders do have that federal benefit and we're able to charge a premium for that premium service, we're covering a, uh, just over 60% of the, of the expenses for that service through the fare box which is uh, pretty much unheard of for a public transit system. Um, we are primarily funded through the federal government, uh, through the Federal Transit Administration. They are our single largest funding source. Uh, beyond that, we have the fare box, uh, what our riders are paying. We have the local communities that we request funding uh, from every year. Portsmouth uh, is, uh, is contributing to Coast significantly. Uh, one of the largest contributing communities to Coast, uh, just over $200,000 a year uh, through uh, our, for our core services as well as for the trolley system. Big supporter, and we're very appreciative of that. Um, we we uh, garner a lot of revenues through the ads that we sell on the sides of the buses. That's a significant revenue stream for us. And in in some cases, we're hoping to be able to expand that into advertising on some of our bus shelters in uh, some of, you know, outside of some of the more sensitive areas that there might be in communities uh, for that, that uh, revenue opportunity. Um, I did want to, uh, if you don't mind going to the next slide, Bill, I did want to point out a few things, and, and I, I do have a handout in the back. If you want to know more about Coast, I, I figured I'd spend my time doing something a little different. Um, so I, I, I def definitely wanted to point out about 65 to 75 percent of residents in the, in the city of Portsmouth are within walking distance to public transit, whether that be coast or Wildcat Transit. It's a significant number. Um, and walking distance is considered to be half a mile. Um, uh, you know, did you know that, that your city has some of the highest uh, uh, public transit service levels of any community in New Hampshire. Now, that's a double-edged sword. Uh, there aren't a lot of communities in New Hampshire with public transit service. Um, so, uh, but of the communities that do have public transit service, you have fantastic public transit service in terms of the levels of service you have. We have a, uh, a, a bus every 30 minutes for a good part of the day or a trolley every 30 minutes for a good part of the day in the city and that has made a world of difference in ridership on our system. In the last uh, 10 years, we've seen ridership uh, increase uh, somewhere around 160%, and a big part of that is because of the, the, the way we've expanded and, and the amount of service we've been able to put on the street. A lot of that expansion has been funded through congestion mitigation air quality program. Some of it, that those funds are, are long gone and we've transitioned uh, those those services into our regular federal program. The trolleys are a perfect example of that. Others, um, they're still funded by CMAC, and we they, they they may continue to exist. They may not in the future because uh, the federal funding picture is is quite unknown. Um, what I did want to do, and and this might be a little provocative, but I think that was the point of the night. Is if you could go to the next slide, Bill. So I was going to say, hey, let's take a look in the mirror. If you could hit the next one. How many of you have actually ridden a coast bus or Wildcat Transit? That's a good number. Um, but it's not as many as we'd like to see. Um, so the next question, if 
not as many of you had said that, would be have you ever ridden a coast bus or a Wildcat Transit bus? And, and there's a large part of the Seacoast that has not. Um, and then the next question is why? why? Why do you ride it or why haven't you ridden public transit? There's an awful lot out there. It's very accessible. We've made a lot of efforts into making it easy to find, easy to understand. Um, we've invested very, very heavily, as Wildcat Transit has, into making sure the equipment is um, modern, clean, um, very inviting. We've invested a lot of uh, money and effort into our staffs to make sure that when you get on board, you get a good ride, you get a nice greeting, and you get help if you need it. So we're trying to take down those barriers. Um, and then finally, the question is, if not you, then who is public transit for? And I think we all need to think about that. I, I uh, took a challenge last fall. Our, our work happens to be on a Wildcat Transit route, uh, and I'm, I live in Durham, so I rode Wildcat Transit for <clears throat> Uh, over a month. I saved a, 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 an unbelievable amount of money. I got to work um, much less uh, stressed. I don't know why exactly, but I got there much less stressed. I had a lot of conversations on my way to work that were great. They weren't with myself, worried about, <laughs> worried about all the variety of things that I need to be worried about, like my daughter just texting me now saying, where's mommy? She's not here. I'm supposed to be picked up at the high school. Um, but, um, you know, it, they, they were great conversations, and, and I got to meet people that I had been corresponding with on our Facebook page or through Twitter. Um, it was, it, it, I always say our public transit systems, any public transit system, it's a rolling neighborhood of your community. Everybody's out on their front, front porch waiting to have a nice conversation with you. Um, so I guess with that, I'll, I'll stop off because I've probably used up my five minutes. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got time for Steve, and then we'll have some time for some quick questions. Uh, Steve Pesci is a is special projects manager at the University of New Hampshire, and he's one of the more perceptive transportation planners on, on the Seacoast, someone I've known for a long time who has a lot of, a lot of good, good ideas. Yeah, thank you for the invitation, and uh, my colleagues as well. I've known them for many years, and I think the beauty of being in the Seacoast is it is very small. We all work together, so the two transit systems work together, and we try to figure out creative ways to make our systems work good for everyone. I like to say Wildcat is the other transit system in Portsmouth, and uh, some people say I have a complex about that, but I do think that people don't realize that there are actually two transit systems, although we do share each other's passes. But um, we connect uh, Portsmouth, Newington, and Durham on Route 4. Wildcat Transit connects the university right to your community, and the university is very pleased to be doing that. Um, we view it as a great service for our faculty, staff, and students that really connects them to the larger Seacoast area. It's open to the public, and I think many people don't realize that. They, say, they see the UNH bus and they think, oh, well, that's just for the students. And no, in fact, we are a public transit system, just like Coast, and we welcome the public to ride our buses. And I'll show in a second why. Uh, I think with our route going right through the center of Portsmouth, I hope you will take advantage of that. Um, route 4 is our largest regional route. Um, we actually serve Dover, Newmarket, Rochester, um, nine communities, but Route 4 is our largest ridership route. Um, 115,000 riders last year. Our system, uh, the Wildcat system, was just under 300,000. So we're very proud to call Portsmouth our, our largest route. And it runs very frequently. Our, our system is a little different. It, it fluctuates with the academic year. So during the academic year, uh, we run weekday service on an hourly basis connecting Portsmouth to Durham. Um, weekends, slightly more, like 90 minutes. And then in the summer, we still run about 90 minutes in the weekdays, but we do not run on the weekends in the summer. So a little unique. Um, we as Rad said, have been very much focused on providing quality, a quality experience for people. And with our uh, predominantly student clientele, uh, they're very technologically connected. So we're very pleased that 
Uh, we have uh, our schedules are all uh, in the UNH mobile app, very easy to navigate. We also have real-time transit information, which uh, if any of you are not familiar with that, we use the next bus system. So you can, on your smartphone, see exactly where the bus is. It predicts when it will be at your stop. But you don't need a smartphone. You can also call on the telephone or text or use your home computer and get the same services. Um, that has been so successful for us. In the first year of activating that system, it had 1.25 million. And I had to ask the staff, is that real? But it is real. 1.25 million hits on the UNH Wildcat Transit mobile app in the first year. So another reason our system is a little different, and I was asked to like think about models for Portsmouth, and I live in Portsmouth, have lived here for 30 years. Our system is unique in that it's a free fare system. So anyone who has a valid UNH faculty, staff, or student ID can ride the bus for free. If you don't have a UNH ID, it's $1.50 per trip. Um, as Rad said, these are all low floor, modern buses. They're fully ADA accessible. They have bike racks on the front. Um, they, are, they have audible stop announcements, which uh, uh, we're very pleased with that system and how it works, and it helps our riders, uh, not just riders with disabilities, but we get 25% new population every year of students, and they don't always know what the stop names are or where. They, maybe it's their first trip to Portsmouth, and they don't really know when they're in Market Square. So we have all of that. We're also very proud of our fleet. Uh, we branded it as the Eco Cat Fleet. Uh, we run all of our buses are either compressed natural gas powered, that's about 60% of our fleet, or run on B20 biodiesel year round. So we are avoiding about, last year was over 110,000 gallons of traditional petroleum fuel on our fleet and very quiet, low emissions buses. Uh, it's about 85% faculty staff, as I said, and Bill. Um, the route is a little different than Coast, and I just wanted to show the map to point it out. If the, the pointer, is that the laser pointer? Um, and this has really been a traditional uh, example of the Portsmouth route right through downtown. It goes Market Square right down the Islington Street corridor. Our system is built around a very fundamental goal, which is to get faculty, staff, and students from where they live to the core of campus as fast or even faster than they can drive and park at UNH. So we go right through the heart of some of Portsmouth's core neighborhoods. We've been, we keep our routes consistent. They don't change much from year to year, which is really important. Um, and as I said, we go to Newington uh, through the malls uh, and to core campus. Um, we connect uh, on campus. We're lucky enough to have the Amtrak down Easter and we connect there with also our local bus system, which is called the Campus Connector, and is free to everyone. You don't need an ID, you just walk on in Durham, and that actually carries almost 900,000 passenger trips a year. So combined, there's about 1.3 million trips. We're hoping for our 11th record growth ridership year, and uh, Bill mentioned measuring it in terms of vehicle miles traveled. It's somewhere between four and five million vehicle miles traveled removed from our local roadway system. So it's, it's very significant. Um, a few points I wanted to bring just quickly about UNH. And people will say, oh, but that's a college campus. It really isn't applicable to our community. But I think in the case of Portsmouth, there's a lot that's similar. UNH, our, our fundamental principle of our master plan and our, of our campus, and I think all of you who've been there will identify with this, is it's a walking campus. If you ask me nothing else about the master plan of UNH, that's it. It's a walking campus. Everything revolves around that. The class schedule times, built that starting at 10 minutes after the hour, it's built on a walking campus. Portsmouth is a walking town, and that's one of our strengths as a, as a beautiful seacoast town. We try from the first touch, when a prospective student first comes to UNH, after the academic quality, what we want them to understand and feel is the community and the experience. And part of that is a message very clear. You can come here and you do not need a private car to get around. We'll get you to Portland on the train, Portsmouth on the bus. We have zip cars, bike lanes. Don't bring your car. Freshmen, you can't bring your car. And the rest of you, please don't. Save your money. Enjoy the experience of not having a car. So we provide this range of options. 
We use technologies, as I mentioned. We address the safety blanket issues, and I, I think Rad mentioned this, or, and Scott, we provide guaranteed ride home as well, so that if you take the bus to campus, emergency happens, we guarantee we will give you a private ride to your house, to your, your child's school or a medical emergency, we will take you there. Don't let that be a reason to drive your own car. We will, we will deal with that emergency if it comes up. And you know what? The fact is, a community of 16,000 people, that happens on average about two times a year. It's the cheapest insurance policy in the world. And we develop a lot of partnerships with private developments and our municipalities as well. So it works. I just want to leave you with this message. I think in terms of Bill mentioned transportation demand management, well, it works at UNH. With, when you have a robust transit system, you can grow at a faster rate than your parking demand has grown. So simple statistics. Our student commuter permit sales over the past 10 years are down 40%. The student population has grown. Our student permit sales are down 40%. Echoing what Bill is saying about the demographic shift, I can absolutely attest to that. The mobile phone is the transportation component for a lot of our, our students coming in. They, care, they would be much more upset if their cell phone got damaged than if they had access to a car. I, you cannot overstate that. So you can grow and not grow your parking demand we're very concerned about traffic, so we want to be careful of that. Our overall parking permit growth, again, flat. Even faculty, staff, and other residents is basically flat. We've grown as a university 5 10% or more, and our parking demand is down. And we're very, we do a lot of surveys, a lot of academics at UNH. We have a lot of very smart people with a lot of resources, so we, we survey the community a lot. The biggest trend that has increased apart from not owning a car, is when we ask off-campus students about their choice of housing locations. 12, 13 years ago, about 10% said, yeah, I look at the transit routes, I decide where I want to live based on the transit routes. Now, that number is more like 60 to 70%. So there have been major shifts in our students. I also want to leave a thought about bikes. Uh, bikes are very big at UNH, of course, on a college campus. Uh, we've been moving into things like in that second picture, um, doing collaborations with the art community. So an art bike rack program where we bring together the arts <clears throat> creative community to develop bike racks. We have over 2,500 bike rack capacity at UNH. Sounds like a lot, but we have 6,800 parking spaces. So everything is in context. We actively manage all of that stuff. The transit routes, some of you may have seen, we've done a route productivity study over the past few months. We're going to be tweaking our routes in Portsmouth and Dover and Newmarket. Um, we actively manage that. Uh, we average 30 passengers per run on our buses. That's the average year-round passenger count on a Wildcat transit bus. We have some that look like the Singapore picture. How about 92 passengers on a bus that has seats for... 56 tops. So we run some very crowded buses, but I assure you, if you take the bus from Portsmouth, that will be uh, not the common perception. So I guess I'll stop there. I'm very pleased to be here, and I really hope that you'll check out the, the other transit system, the UNH buses. There are some schedules in the back, or check us out on the UNH mobile app. Thank you. Thanks for our panelists, and Phil Lyons. Thank you very much.